أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وبه نستعين إنه خير ناصر ومعين ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم ثم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وخاتم النبيين وسيد المرسلين أبي القاسم محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين My respected brothers and sisters in Islam and Iman, Salaamun Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. Alhamdulillah for this opportunity to once again come together as we near the completion of what I believe is our seventh day of fasting. May Allah accept all of your amal. Today I want to do a bit of a different structure in terms of the presentation, inshallah, um, we'll spend a little bit less time on the hadith at the beginning, Um, I'll introduce the topic and then instead of um, doing tafsir of the Qur'an at the end, I'll um, stop and if there's any questions that brothers or sisters would like to ask, then we can do that inshallah. So um, as we've done in previous nights, I want to begin with a hadith um, about fasting and about the month of Ramadan. This one is a, an advice about, has to do with the etiquette of, of eating, iftar, um, or eating in general. And it's about somebody, it's a story, a small story about somebody named uh, Wahab ibn Abdullah, um, who was also known as Abu Juhayfa. Abu Juhayfa was one of the good companions of the Prophet and he was one of the narrators of Hadith. Um, What happened is that he himself narrates that one time I went to the Messenger of Allah, I was in his company. And it seems like he had eaten a lot and he had eaten fast. So when he's in the presence of the Messenger of Allah, basically he belches. Now you know what belching is, right? I don't need to explain that, right? The expulsion of, of air with a certain noise, right? Okay, from the mouth. So he belches, okay? So there in that gathering, the Prophet addresses him. He says, Ya Aba Juhaifa, O Abu Juhaifa. اخفض جشعك فإن أكثر الناس فإن أكثر الناس شبعا في الدنيا أطولهم جوعا يوم القيامة. He tells him, Oh Abu Juhayfa, you should control your belching. Because don't you know that most of the people who will be hungry, those most of the people who will be full. In this, and satiated in this world, will have to bear hunger for the, um, the, the will have to bear hunger the longest in the hereafter. So he's warning him against it. He's saying that look at here you are you're stuffing yourself, but don't you realize that's going to be a cause for you to be hungry in the hereafter. So one question that comes to mind is why is it that the prophet addresses him publicly, you know, there in front of the other people in the gathering? Usually the Prophet, when he would want to tell people something, he would do so in private. But it seems that this was something that was of such concern to the Prophet. Maybe we think it's a small thing, somebody belching loudly after they eat. Okay, fine. In some cultures, that's considered a good thing. It's a sign of being polite that you appreciate the food. 
But here the Prophet was saying, no, you don't do this. And it was enough to say it in front of that gathering. It shows the severity of what he wanted to convey. Maybe he wanted to educate other people as well. Secondly, we see that the Prophet is making an analogy. He's saying that, okay, somebody who stuffs himself in this world will be hungry in the hereafter. What does that mean? Perhaps being hungry in the hereafter is um, a sort of figurative language that the Prophet is using. He's trying to say that in the hereafter, there will, there will be those people who are lacking something. They'll be lacking spirituality, lacking proximity to Allah. And they'll feel that sense of lacking on the Day of Judgment. And one of the ways of preventing us from that light of Allah and getting close to Allah is by stuffing ourselves. So the lesson that we learn from this is that not, not that we shouldn't eat, no. It's not that we shouldn't eat well, but we shouldn't stuff ourselves. We should take it easy, especially when it comes time for iftar. After all, one of the purposes of fasting is to give our body a break after you know, 11 months of intense um, eating regularly, you know, on time every meal. Here's a time for giving it a bit of a chance, you know, taking it a bit easy. Um, that, that's the way that inshallah we'll be able to get to and, and be able to experience the deeper dimensions of our fasting. Please say salawat ala Muhammad wa Muhammad. We'll continue now with our discussion about different advices and tips that we have from the teachings of the Qur'an and the Ahlul Bayt about how we can build Islamic families. And until now we talked about a couple of very important principles. The principle of having love in the family and the principle of having spirituality in the family as well. Now as far as the spirituality is concerned, um, we talk, yes, yesterday I gave some tips then inshallah we can act upon that will let us experience more spirituality in our lives and in our, in our homes. Um, there's more tips that could be talked about. Maybe throughout the course of the discussion, I might mention um, some of those in the next um, remaining lectures that we have uh, for the first half of the month of Ramadan. But today I'd like to switch to a third um, area a third sort of step that we can take if we want to improve our family lives. What is this third step, the third piece of advice? The third piece of advice is that we need to be people who seek out criticism. If we become individuals who are seeking out criticism from our family members, from our spouses, criticism that's constructive that will be a way, inshallah, of improving our family life. Now, this might seem a bit strange, because seeking out criticism isn't something that we typically want to go ahead and do. Normally, we'd like to instead seek, out, seek praise and seek applaud from other people. So, in order to explain this concept, I first want to ask you a question. You can answer this yourself. What happens, what would you do if somebody told you something bad about yourself, that you have this particular fault. Or think back to the last time that happened. Somebody pulled you over and said, you know what, um, pulled you aside and said that, okay, I've noticed that you're doing this thing, you have this bad habit, um, and it bothers me. Or that's not right. Or what if somebody told you off and they said that you're actually doing this thing and it's a sin? Right? What would you feel like? How is it that people react to being, able, to being criticized and some fault being pointed out? The Qur'an talks about different mentalities that people have when they are told off and they're told something. In Surah Baqarah, Surah 2, verse number 206, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes one type of person. He's, this is a person who is a hypocrite. Somebody who is an arrogant hypocrite. How does he react? A'udhu billahi minash shaitan rajim. Wa'idha qila lahu ittaqillah أَخَذَتْهُ الْعِزَّةُ بِالْإِثْمِ فَحَسْبُهُ جَهَنَّمْ وَلَا بِئَسَ الْمِهَادِ Such a person, when he's told that, you know what, you're going in the wrong direction. Why don't you have some taqwa of Allah? Why don't you mend your ways and come on the path of righteousness? You're doing something wrong. What's that person's response? His conceit seizes him sinfully. Instead of listening to this piece of advice and trying to say, okay, you know what, I have an opportunity to improve myself, to come closer to Allah. 
His reaction is that he becomes conceited, he becomes arrogant. And he responds forcefully. And he only goes further and further away from God and towards hell. That's one type of person. We have examples of this type of person in history. One of these people in history who's like this, his name is Abdul Malik Ibn Marwan. He's one of the famous Khulafa of the Umayyads. He was, of course, somebody who was very much a, you know, an oppressor and an anti um, a- against the Ahlul Bayt. History tells us that this man, Abdul Malik ibn Marwan, um, one time he goes on the mimbar in the city of Medina and he's so fil- filled with arrogance and self conceit, he tells people openly from the mimbar that I swear by God. That if any of you tries to do Amr bin Ma'roof to me and tell me to have taqwa of Allah, then I'm going to cut off his head. All right? You tell me that I'm doing something wrong, my response is not only am I not going to listen to you, not only am I not going to act on what you have to say, I'm going to turn around and I'm going to cut off your head. All right? Now this is, you might say, is a, an extreme example. But the Qur'an talks to us in a way that you know, it's, it's an, it, it knows. It knows the way we are. Right? After, after all, the Qur'an is the book of Allah and Allah is the one who created us. He knows our natures. And we have to admit honestly to ourselves that sometimes when the possibility that we're wrong about something comes up and somebody tells me that, especially my spouse... My reaction is a minor, inshallah it's a minor version, a minor version of the, the, the caliph, um, Abdul Malik ibn Marwan. Right? I'm ready to whip out my sword. And, what did you say? Right? You know? Or my stick in some cases. Right? That's one example. All right? That they only get more arrogant and they turn away from Allah as a result. There's another example we have in the Quran as well too. Let's go to the story of Nabi Musa alayhi salam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is conversing with Nabi Musa in the valley of Tuwa. Surah Taha from verse 15 onwards. A'udhu billahi min shaitan rajim. Hal ataka hadithu Musa. I'm sorry, it's not Surah Taha. It's in Surah Nazi'at. Hal ataka hadithu Musa idh nadahu rabbuhu bil wadil muqaddasi Tuwa. اذهب إلى فرعون إنه طغى فقل هل لك إلى أن تزكى وأهديك إلى ربك فتخشى فأراه الآية الكبرى فكذب وعصى ثم أدبر يسعى فحشر فنادى فقال أنا ربكم الأعلى This is one of a couple of different places in the Quran where it describes this incident. Basically Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after having this special conversation with Nabi Musa alayhi salam and revealing himself to him in a very presential sort of way. It's a special experience, a special gift to Nabi Musa. He then gives him a mission. He says, go to Fir'aun and call him to righteousness. Call him to purify himself and do so in a kind sort of way. Right? وَقُولَ in, in Surah Ta'ah says, وَقُولَ لَهُ قَوْلًا لَيِّنَا Speak to him Oh you Musa and oh you Harun, his helper, his brother, go and go to Fir'aun, go to the biggest tyrant of the land and speak to him in a soft voice, in a soft tone. Perhaps he's going to reform himself. So they go there, despite all the challenges, these two shepherds, they go to the biggest, the palace of the biggest tyrant of the land, the biggest dictator, and somehow they gain admittance to that audience. And there, we can imagine that Nabi Musa a.s. of course, he executes the command of Allah, he speaks to Fir'aun in a kind way, but he tells him that, you know what, Fir'aun, you're wrong. You're not going in the right path. You you have to improve yourself. There's a purpose for why you came to this world. And this purpose is to purify yourself, to become a good person. You have a lot of flaws. Come, let me help you overcome them. Now this is a ma'asum individual speaking in a soft tone. Okay? But how is it that Fir'aun responds? We're told in Nahjul Balagha, Imam Ali Islam recalls this incident. He says that Fir'aun, what he does is he makes fun of Nabi Musa and Harun. Right? He makes fun of them. What does he say? He says, Sarawatana Muhammad wa anhum. 
Sure. Sure. There's a um, excuse me. There's an announcement to be made that kids, uh, children who are 12 year old, 12 years old and under, um, and are not in the babysitting, they're invited to go to the puppet show. Please say salawat ala Muhammad. <clears throat> so his reaction is what? He makes fun of Nabi Musa and Harun. How does he make fun of them? He makes fun of the clothing that they're wearing. He says, look at these people. You know, they're wearing these mean type of clothing. If they were really what they say they are, then they would at least have gold bracelets on their wrists. Because right? that was a sign of somebody who was important at that time. And then in the Quran, it describes his reaction. What does he say? It says that, Nabi Musa says, I will guide you to your Lord that you may fear him. Then he showed him the greatest sign. What was the greatest sign? The staff and then the, the hand. But he denied and he disobeyed and then he turned back walking swiftly. He mustered the people around him and he proclaimed. What is he going to proclaim? Is he going to say that I believe in the message of Nabi Musa? I am going to reform myself. I understand that he said the truth. I do have faults and I do have flaws. No. He says, "Ana Rabbukumul A'la. I am your exalted Lord. Ana. I. Now this is the example that the Quran brings. But once again, we have to ask ourselves, how do we react? When our spouse even tells us in a nice sort of way and points out something that is a problem that we have, there's truth in what they have to say. Do we not react with the immediate reaction of Anna? I am this and I am that. I respond by defending myself. Or do I think about what they have to say and see maybe there is something there that I can take some benefit from. I can improve myself. So this is another example of how people react. Now, what is the way we're supposed to treat this Incident when somebody tells us something that's negative about ourselves, how should we, how how ought we to react? We see from a tradition, and this is one of a number of traditions from the Ahlul Bayt and Muslim. This is just one of them. This is reported from Imam Sadiq alayhi salam. He reported to have said, "Ahabu ikhwani ilayya man ahda ilayya uyubi." Who is the most beloved of individuals in the sight of Nabi Imam Sadiq alayhi It's that individual who gifts him with his faults. He gifts him with his faults. The perspective of the Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam is completely contrary to the perspective of Fir'aun and his like. Completely contrary to the perspective of that hypocrite, that arrogant hypocrite and his like. And Abdul Malik ibn Marwan. It's a perspective that if somebody tells me something negative about myself, wait a minute, actually, that's something which is really beneficial for me. I appreciate, that's a gift for me. I'm going to become happy when you point out something to me. When you criticize me, when you um, tell me that I've done something incorrect, then I'm not going to try to lash out at you, try to defend myself, try to whip out my stick, right? I'm going to thank you because you've done a favor to me. Why have you done a favor to me? Because after all, what am I here for in this world? What is the purpose why I've been created? The purpose is to become a perfect servant of Allah. Perfect. And we all know ourselves. We all know that we are not perfect. We have flaws. We have faults. And if we don't see that, brothers and sisters, if we don't realize that we are people who are needy of perfection, and if we don't have that desire for becoming perfect, then there is something wrong with us. That, that, that's not the way that we are created. Allah SWT says in the Quran, A'udhu Billahi Min Shaitan Rahim, Surah Shams, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, وَالشَّمْسِ وَضُحَاهَا وَالْقَمَرِ إِذَا تَلَاهَا وَالنَّهَارِ إِذَا جَلَّاهَا وَالْلَيْلِ إِذَا يَغْشَاهَا وَالسَّمَاءِ وَمَا بَنَاهَا وَالْأَرْضِ وَمَا طَحَاهَا وَنَفْسٍ وَمَا سَوَّاهَا فَلَهَمَهَا فُجُورَهَا وَتَقْوَاهَا This is all one sentence. It's all the same sentence. One after the other, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is building up to something very important that He wants to say. 
What is it that he wants to convey by swearing upon all these celestial bodies and amazing instances of his creation? If you want to take out one verse from the Quran which Allah has emphasized above others, this is the verse that you can choose. Whoever has purified his soul will be successful. And whoever sullies and dirties his soul has lost out. That means that I, if I'm a believer in the message of God, if, I'm, if I can connect to the reason why, why I've been created, I have to be on a search for the purification of my soul. Which means that one after the other, I need to hunt down these faults that I have and these flaws, I need to take care of them, zap them away. Now, how am I going to find out what these faults are? One of the most effective ways is for the people who know me to inform them, me of them. And who knows me better than my spouse? Who is it that sees the bad side of me after all? Right, we're so good at putting on a good, you know, I can wear my nice you know, outfit and put on a nice smile and nice behavior and decorum when I'm at work, when I'm with my friends, when I come and spend time at the center. Right? But we know, when we get back home, that's when our true colors are revealed. Right? That's when we, our tongue is let loose. That's when the criticism begins. That's when, in some cases, the shouting begins. Right? The spite begins to flow. So, who is it that's going to be the best of my friends? Remember what Imam Sadiq alayhi the one, my best of my companions, the best of my friends. In other um, traditions were told, the one you should love the most is the one who can point out your faults to you in the best way. So who is it going to be the best of my friends? It's going to be my spouse. Have you ever thought about our spouse as being the best of our friends? What a wonderful way that the Ahlul Bayt have taught us to approach marriage to approach family life, that my spouse is going to be the best of my friends because he or she is going to be one of the main means by which I'm going to get into heaven. I'm going to accomplish the purpose for which, for which I have been created. Peace be salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Brothers and sisters, I mentioned one of the ways of finding out about our flaws, which is that somebody tells us about them. One of the other ways is if we see a flaw in somebody else, then there's one of two things that we can do. And one of them is that we can immediately start to think about, oh, this person is so you know, bad or lame because they have this flaw, right? Let me tell them something. Or the other thing that I can take is, wait a minute, I'm seeing that negative characteristic in that person. Let me ask myself, do I have that same thing as well too? What if I were in the same situation? How would I be like? So this is another powerful way for us to be able to hunt down those flaws and get working on them. What is that way? That when we see something negative being displayed, let's say by our spouse, something that really bothers us, Let's try this strategy that instead of trying to lash out, let's ask ourselves the question, wait a minute, where am I with respect to that? Maybe I realize that I'm the one who taught him or her that. I'm their teacher. I'm the one who taught them to be like that. right? Or maybe that same thing exists in me, within me, but it's even worse and more severe and deep-rooted and entrenched than it exists in them. Let me first fix it in myself. Then, inshallah, by them seeing me that I've fixed it in myself, then they will also follow suit. The point is that the immediate reaction shouldn't always be to lash out and criticize other people. When we see negative behavior, when we're told about negative things, our first reaction to, should, shouldn't be to lash out, it should be that how can I improve myself? There's a wonderful example of this that's very inspiring for me. Um, that we have of one of our great scholars by the name of Mullah Mahdi Naraqi. Mullah Mahdi Naraqi was the author of um, a very important work within Shia literature 
known as Jami'u Sa'adat. Jami'u Sa'adat is a book of ethics and spirituality. He was the author of that book and what happened is that after he compiled this book and he published it, it, so it hit the, the, the market and it gained popularity. And so he became somebody who is well known. Now what happens is that one time he decides to go and travel to Najaf and the word gets out that, okay, Mullah Mahdi Naraki is traveling to Najaf. At that time, Najaf was the capital of Shia learning in the world and the great scholars were um, living in that area, in that city. So when they hear that he's coming, everyone gets excited. So he, he gets to Najaf and then everyone starts to come and see him and greet him and welcome him. But there's one scholar by the name of um, Sayyid Bahrul Ulum um, who doesn't go to see him. Sayyid Bahrul Ulum was a very famous scholar living in, in Najaf at that time. He doesn't go to see him. So after a day or two when Mullah Mahdi Naraki sees that Sayyid Bahrulum has not come to see him, he goes to see him himself. So he gains an audience with him and he you know, introduces himself, says salam to him. But he sees that Sayyid Bahrul Ulum is not giving him a warm reception. He's turning a cold shoulder to him. So he spends a little bit of time, you know, offers his greetings and then he leaves. A few days later, once again he sees that Sayyid Bahlulum has not come to see him, he himself again takes initiative, he gets an appointment to go see him, he goes and sees him, he greets him warmly, he does his duty. But once again he sees that Sayyid Bahlulum doesn't show him a good response. Now after some time, it's coming to the end of his stay in Najaf, once again he makes a plan to go and see Sayyid Bahlulum. His friends tell him that look it, you know, why are you going to see him? He didn't come to see you. You know, you should just forget about it, right? Why do you, you always went to see him twice? That's enough. But he says, no, no, I must do my duty after all. He goes and sees Sayyid Bahlulum. The third time, this last time, before he's about to leave, he sees that Sayyid Bahlulum and not only greets him properly, now he's very warm to him, very receptive, very kind. And then they spend some time together and then he leaves. Now, people are wondering about this, the people around Sayyid Bahrulum, and they say to him, because he was a great scholar, and they saw what was happening. They say to him that, you know, Sayyid Bahrulum, we saw that the first two times, you know, you were very cold to uh, Mullah Mahdi Naraki. Why was it the third time you were very kind to him? So what does he say? He says that, you see, um, I knew that Mullah Mahdi Naraki had written this book, and it, when I read this book, I was extremely impressed. But I wanted to see one thing. I wanted to test him. I wanted to see whether this author who had written this book, does he actually act upon what he's written? So I decided to test him. And I saw that exactly the way that he's described that we should be in terms of our behavior with other people, that's exactly how we acted. He was not treating me in the way that he was being treated. He was treating me in the way that he ought and wished to be treated by me. And therefore, I saw that indeed, he does deserve to be that author of Jami'u Sa'adat. We get a, a very important lesson from this, brothers and sisters, that our reaction shouldn't always be the instinctual reaction when it comes to responding you know, with spite and with anger and with arrogance when it comes to people showing us negative behavior. No, oftentimes we have to see what is my duty in this circumstance. His duty was to just be there and just, you know, react. Maybe there's some reason why Sayyid Bahrulum is not showing him that respect. And so he did, he did his duty, he let him do whatever he wanted to do. That's the way that we should be as well too. We should always be looking to see what our duty is. We should use these opportunities as opportunities to grow. Just to sum up, uh, we talked today about the importance of, the third step is the importance of seeking out criticism that's constructive in terms of building us. And we talked about different um, approaches, different reactions that people have when they're told that there's something wrong with them. There's a reaction of arrogance. There's a reaction of uh, pride and then there's a reaction of being thankful and appreciative when somebody tells us something which is a fault in ourselves inshallah we'll continue this discussion if Allah gives us a tawfiq 
in tomorrow's lecture. Peace be upon Muhammad.